Good morning, everyone. And for those of us, uh, for those of us in the audience that are from further away, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, my name is Jimmy Chen. I'm the managing director of StorageX, and I'm here today to host a very exciting symposia, uh, establishing battery production in the U.S. Stories from the front lines. And we have uh, two amazing speakers that will speak to us. Uh, this is Abraham Anapowski of TRI, and also Kurt Kauti of Scylla Nanotechnologies. So with that, I'd like to start with Abraham, and let me do a quick introduction. So uh, Abraham Anapowski, uh, Dr. Abraham Anapowski, is a Director of Advanced Manufacturing Research at the Toyota Research Institute, TRI, in Los Altos, California. He has worked in R&D and manufacturing in semiconductors and clean energy for over two decades. His work has focused on materials discovery, device optimization, and data-driven methods in batteries, photovoltaics, magnetics, and a variety of other material systems. He obtained his BS in physics from San Francisco State University and his MS and PhD in material science and engineering from the University of California, Berkeley. With that, I'd like to welcome Abraham and turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Jimmy. And uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to be here speaking at this symposium. Um, and I, uh, I'm going to give you a little more background about what I did because I'm joining very illustrious speakers in the past, um, like Jeff Don, and I'm not quite well as well known as uh, Jeff Don. So my talk today is going to focus on the need for collaboration through emerging capabilities in informatics and US manufacturer as a way of ensuring that the path towards vehicle electrification runs smoothly. So as Jimmy mentioned, uh, I've been working in clean energy for a long time. I, uh, at Berkeley, I worked on uh, cathode discovery and synthesis with Mark Adolf and other people. And um, since then I've worked in a wide variety of technical engineering uh, efforts in lithium ion batteries. Um, in the last six years, I've been really lucky to be at Toyota Research Institute working on uh, data-driven methods, first in uh, materials discovery and battery informatics, and recently over the last three years in manufacturing. And in my career up to the point where I started working on manufacturing, Doing the engineering and science of batteries is is a, is a different undertaking. Um, there's a lot of art in manufacturing. There's a lot of constraints that you don't have when you're focused on engineering or optimization of a process. And so getting new technology or new methodologies into battery manufacturing is much harder um, than it than than it would seem as many people here have probably experienced, uh, developing a new product or new technique in lithium ion battery manufacturing is very challenging. Um, but I wanna make the case that there's a way to facilitate that and tools. So the reason why is because we need to make sure that in the process of building electric vehicles that we, we are able to let everybody in society uh, into the into the game. Right now, electric vehicles are very expensive relative to the price of any other car. And we need to make significant improvements in the price, safety, and reliability of lithium ion batteries. Traditionally, lithium ion batteries, the, the usage case kind of allowed for inefficient production, let's say, or lack of kind of improvement. Uh, at, a, at a sufficient rate. But recently the market and the application from lithium ion batteries has changed from consumer electronics to vehicles. And that introduces all these new considerations that we have to deal with. But at the same time, over the last five years, new methods for a uh, data-driven approach to understand batteries and also now understand manufacturing have uh, have kind of come online starting from academia. Um, and 
I think the reason we can work cooperatively is that the market potential is huge. It's a rise, it's a rising tide. So the traditional model of kind of a low margin, zero sum game and competition is no longer true in the in the US. Um, the other thing uh, uh, about this is that uh, lithium ion battery manufacturing traditionally has, has involved a lot of kind of inside know-how, uh, people, you know, skill and experience. And as we expand the number of, rapidly expand the number of manufacturing plants, manufacturing capability, those few people who have that experience are going to be sparsely kind of distributed. And so we need other ways to share knowledge and um, allow for efficient and effective battery manufacturing. So just to, to, to illustrate this point of, you know, getting, let, get, letting everyone have access. That, so that I, I compiled this list of range and cost for not all uh, EVs, but the, the, the bulk of the ones that are out there on the road. And the average price is about $63,000. Right now, the average price of a car in the US is $48,000. And that is an all time high. So uh, relative to inflation, the price is expected to go down. There's a sort of scarcity that's driving the price up. So that difference is actually probably greater than it seems. Um, and why is that? Oops, there we go. So traditionally, the lithium ion battery manufacturing culture is, is a low margin business. Um, and because of the low margin aspect of it, people are generally risk averse. So change, even if it's positioned as a good change is an unknown and it's a risk. So generally the type of change that's available or that's embraced is, is relatively uh, kind of low. And the real emphasis is making sure your battery factory runs kind of status quo. Um, as I mentioned previously, it's a zero sum game in terms of competition. It, it's not an expanding market or it's a very, the, the market is expanding very kind of slowly, uh, you know, with personal electronics. Cell phones drove that, but it, it's it's not driven to the point where people would undertake significant kind of reformation or um, innovation. And the other thing uh, is there's no real pedagogy. There's no shared knowledge. So you have each one of these manufacturers kind of closely guarding their secrets. Now, I think this is the thing and my years of uh, battery work, that's always been uh, frustrating is I know there are a lot of experts out there in the audience, people who know more than me. Um, but I also know there's probably a few things I know that they don't know. And I think driving the industry to a better place requires as much sharing of information as is reasonably possible. Um, but it's, you know, part of the reason for uh, batteries being lithium ion batteries being difficult to manufacture they're very complex systems it's hard you can't take them apart and see like oh yeah this you know this thing right here didn't work or the tab is slightly misaligned when once they're assembled that's it they go at the door they either work or they don't but uh nonetheless to the credit of people working in the industry uh the energy density has increased a significant amount in 30 years um one of the ways to see that is the, the energy density of what's the 18650 format has almost tripled. And so now you can regularly buy uh, 18650s, for example, that have, uh, you know, three and a half uh, amp hour capacity and, uh, you know, pretty good rate performance and good cycle life. Um, a lot of that improvement actually, though, has been in the focused on the inactive components, the separators, the current collectors and so forth. Materials innovation, like moving from LCO to NMC and NCA, have um, have uh, uh, contributed somewhat. But I think one of the you know paradoxical examples is LFP is lower energy density um, than LCO, and yet uh, LFP batteries have higher density than the initial um, the initial batteries from Sony. So. The low margin. So on this plot on the left, this is the 2022 profit margins for a variety of battery manufacturers, battery manufacturers given as revenue versus net profits, and then plotted along these diagonal dashed lines. Uh, these are the 
limits of, of different margins. And you can see most manufacturers fall in the kind of one to 5% uh, regime. The um, vertical lines indicate uh, for a given revenue, how, uh, where, where they, where you would uh, hit the net profit kind of uh, margin line and the kind of solid light colored lines are historical averages. Um, and so, you know, you have this low margin uh, business and at the same time, you have a situation where you have relatively low yields. Now, I put low in single quotes because it's actually very difficult to find information about what, you know, for a particular factor, factory or a particular manufacturer, what their actual yields are. And some of that depends on how you define yield, uh, because yield could be from the minute you assemble the cell, the, the that number um, divide or you know that number compared to the number of cells that go out the door as validated cells it could be the total material, inactive materials, uh, active materials and components that go in versus those that go out. Some people would just argue that it's uh, you know your net operating margin. But however you however you slice it, it, it's not good. I think the number that a lot of people agree on is about 80%, although different uh, manufacturers can be higher or lower than that. And certainly during the startup phase of a factory runs for 15 years, about a year of that is spent at extremely low yields uh, in the kind of 50% or less regime. And if you amortize that out over time, it's, it, it, it doesn't look that great. So, um, the existing paradigm that has allowed this to kind of go through is that when you look at safety events, uh, traditionally, I mean, it's not good when your laptop catches fire, especially if you're on a plane or it's in your house and it burns the house down or your phone catches on fire, but there has been relatively few, uh, fatalities or serious injuries due to this. And in addition, if it's just a quality issue, um, then your the the replacement cost for something like for for conventional lithium ion battery applications is on the order of ten dollars. Now the paradigm moving forward from the in the twenty twenties is that there are extreme safety consequences. So, for example, uh, this is the Felicity Ace, this famous case. I th I believe the cause was a Porsche Taycan caught fire, and the 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 vessel was loaded with other EVs. Uh, lots of uh, VW EVs, and they all caught fire, and they couldn't put this fire out, and there was, you know, significant kind of destruction. Um, and then on top of that, the the consequence of even if you say like one bad apple, you know, potentially a cell that uh, catches fire, um, or or is damaged, potential replacement costs are in the kind of ten thousand dollar regime. So both the safety. The, the, the consequence of um, quality control and then the potential costs are very, very uh, high relative to you know, the first 30 years of lithium ion battery production. Um, and with this new paradigm, uh, there are even uh, more worries over margin because, excuse me, um, the profit margin in automotive is already low. Toyota is consistently one of the best performers when it comes to profit margin, but that's 7%. So if you add these very expensive packs into the car, you know, you really need to make sure that you can control that all the way through the value chain. And that one that starts with, you know, making efficient use of materials and being able to make good predictions uh, about and good quality control about how the, the battery will, how the cell will perform in the field. Um, the, I think the other kind of interesting thing on here is that Tesla, which is, is, you know, their stated numbers, they're very profitable now, but if you amortize it over the last five years, because the investment in, uh, battery production, it, it's, it's significantly impacted their profits. Now, I think they're going to go on and be, a, you know, continue to be a profitable company, but it does point out the fact that when you make these initial investments, Toyota's stated investment right now is, is around six billion dollars um, in the battery factory in North Carolina. You know, it, it it's going to eat into your profit margins for for a, a time to come. And we want to make sure that when we go into this, this is really a change in 
uh, the vehicle space and not just a kind of a fad. Um, so the good news though, is that while in historically the, um, the nature of battery manufacturing is really contained in kind of the experience of people on the line, there are there is an emerging field of data-driven understanding of batteries, and in fact, an emerging field of informatics and data-driven uh, manufacturing. Um, but we, we need better yields. We need better diagnostic of potential safety issues, which I'll talk about in a little bit. We need better prediction of performance. Um, and we need, personally for me, I think one of the, one of the things I would love to see is the ability of a, of a line to rapidly adapt to new materials, new opportunities. Uh, I, I wanna emphasize again that I'm talking about the manufacturing space within the US. How do we make US manufacturing uh, more competitive? Because the IRA um, it, legislation is going to mean that to get the rebates, uh, you, you know, there's all these rules around sourcing and it's not immediately clear that uh, you know we're going to have sufficient material supply, and uh, whatever we do have, you want to make the most of. And in addition, any innovations in the material space, we would like to be able to capture rapidly. So here is a little uh, blurb from SAP, and there's a lot of you know Siemens and all of these folks have these kind of industry 4.0 or factory of the future. Depends on how on 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 you know people call it different things, and while they look great, and I've had a lot of experience with informatics platforms and manufacturing, actually, the reality is each individual application of manufacturing is special, and these things have to be fine-tuned. So this is not a panacea. And in particular, battery manufacturing is extra special. And what we have found is that it actually requires a tremendous amount of human work problem solving, really trying to understand the process so that when you uh, use data-driven methods to optimize the process, you, um, you're, you're getting value out of the undertaking, out of in the investment to go to data-driven methods. So I'm, I'm just gonna touch on this a little bit and I, and I, I, I wanna stop here and, and point something out. The, the irony of this talk is I'm, I'm making the point that we should use data-driven methods and we should share uh, data um, with, uh, we should share data with each other. But I think some of the most compelling argument uh, that I can make for sharing data is based on my experience uh, with some of the work we've done with battery manufacturing and I can't share that. So <laughs> I hope you appreciate the irony I would love to share some of the results here, but I can't, and I hope to change that situation. But let me just say that one of the main challenges is that the battery manufacturing is made up of hundreds of, of steps where data is recorded and thousands of, of uh, different type of data per one, per every cell that goes up the line, there's tons of cells. So it's a lot of data. And we really have, as my colleague, Matt Gordon says, we really have to have all the data. And uh, at TRI, we're, we're working on this problem with our, our partners throughout Toyota. And we're often asked, what data do you need? And we always say, we, we, we need it all. The additional challenge is that the, the, the data types can vary. So everything from thing, you know, physical properties like the weight of electrolyte to um, you know, your uh, time series uh, formation data, images, you know, all sorts of things. And really integrating those together and having a good way of interacting with them is, is very challenging. So taking an off the shelf product, um, really actually by the time you're done, that off the shelf product is gonna look nothing like, uh, like how it started. And if it doesn't have that flexibility, it's not gonna be very effective. So the, the work actually involved in doing this is much greater than simply purchasing you know, a system, kind of off the shelf system. Um, I'm having some problems with my screen. Uh, so in, in, in our experience in working on this in the real world, there is a, just as I said, I want to emphasize, there's a lot of human effort 
Um, the highest priority right now is getting people into the kind of data mindset that we have to capture all this data and make it accessible. Um, the other thing we've seen is that, you know, battery production, the issues that are happening in now are not the issues that are going to happen in two months. So there's this very dynamic shifting kind of problem set. And so you using MF, things like machine learning in this environment, you know, even uh, to get a good, you know, a simple model to work uh, in, in a multi-physics environment is very challenging. It's powerful, but it, again, it still requires really good engineering and problem solving. Machine learning is, is a tool, it's useful under certain circumstances. And so you have to determine that. The other thing that's very challenging is, you know, getting people, getting an informatics system or data-driven tools to be utilized, to not only to be useful, to, but to be utilized. And that's really a people problem that involves uh, training. It involves uh, different ways to motivate people to use it. Now, I happen to know, you know, through my uh, underground network that there are battery manufacturing companies uh, where people uh, in the US, um, this is two people that, you know, one that worked with, uh, with me and one that worked in one of our research programs. Um, where they are using this approach. And so definitely people uh, use it. I don't know if all the, the, you know, the larger kind of OEMs are using it, but certainly some of the kind of the newer ones are using it. So I know firsthand from my experience that this works and from other people's experience that this works. Um, it, it works with sufficient data. Um, so let me kind of jump ahead to the end here and say, I think one of the areas where uh, the battery manufacturing industry in the US is going to make a very strong case for working collaboratively is around the issue of safety. And I think this because, you know, if you have an EV, have a battery fire or some safety issue because of batteries, I think it kind of tarnishes the overall EV industry. I don't think you think people distinguish that, oh, that's only this company's problem. It's not, for those that you remember, it's not like the, it, you know, the gas tank being in the rear of the Pinto and exploding on the, you know, rear impact. I think this is kind of a, it, it would be perceived as an overall problem. In addition, I think tackling this together helps all of us at the same time. So um, again, uh, my colleague, Matt Gordon is giving a talk at uh, AABC in Europe uh, in a couple of weeks. And we're going to uh, explore this idea of getting people to be interested in figuring out really effective, cost-effective uh, and, and, and accurate ways of assessing things, uh, defects in manufacturing. So, you know, these large metal particles that can cause shorting, uh, you know, that can cause outright failures in production and then uh, but potentially even worse, cause problems in the field over time. Um, and, you know, part of this is a kind of understanding the process and understanding how you can intervene. And so what we, what we want is we, we would like to catch all critical defects, defects that will short out the cell. Um, we want to catch all those before. We want to catch them on, this, on, the, uh, you know, on the electrodes before they go into assembly so they can be removed. So you invest minimal cost because that can take out lots of other active material plus the components plus all the effort that goes into uh, formation and you know, all the steps post uh, assembly. Um, ideally, we, and this is where, uh, where, 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 where data-driven methods come in, we'd like to catch the sub-threshold uh, sub defects by you taking advantage of some of the emerging uh, work around using the electrical signals uh, from formation to spot these kind of defects. Um, and of course, we would like to be able to integrate any defect analysis with the overall informatics platform to get a root cause analysis for these defects. Um, you know, one of the challenges here is that you have to have very rapid image processing, or if you're using an image driven method, or you have to have very rapid processing of any method that you're using to detect these because the speed of the line is very fast. Now, of course, what we don't want, we don't want any critical defects. Or, or defects that will become critical escaping the factory. Um, and and we, 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 don't, we, we really don't want them uh, detected by a catastrophic uh, pack failure. 
That's the worst detection of all. So I, I, because as I said, I, I can't really talk about some the, the you know the work we've done in detail. I, I'm going to save kind of that. I'm hoping to have a discussion because I'm very interested to hear the audience perspective on 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 my opinion and whether that's shared or understood or or even imposed. But the one thing I will tell you is that there there is a rising tide. The market is expanding tremendously for electric for 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 outtake of lithium ion battery production for EVs. And that is going to ensure that <clears throat> you don't really need to compete. And in fact, we can uh, collaborate and cooperate because of the, 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 the market size. So just as a kind of um, uh, to make the case as to why this is effective, uh, I started my career in a semiconductor and I worked in semiconductor for a long time. Um, in the 80s, uh, the U.S. manufactured semiconductor uh, manufacturers were really falling behind uh, international competitors. And so DARPA ponied up some money and they sponsored, they, they formed this consortium called Semitech. And it was uh, industry collaborators coming together to address common problems. And I think, you know, one of the, the really nice things that came out, and I worked on the tail end of this, is this process called the copper dual damascene. And uh, IBM was the first one to come out with this process. But, um, <clears throat> you know, getting it into production is a very different uh, sort, of, sort of beast. And the, the idea behind this is that you need to replace aluminum interconnects in uh, um, uh, greater than 100 nanometer uh, node or feature size um, semiconductor processing with copper to, to, to kind of uh, overcome the electro migration and just the resistive effects of aluminum. However, using copper in silicon is very, very difficult because copper is a triple donor in silicon. So uh, it was verboten in most semiconductor processes when I started working in fabs in the early mid 90s. But, you know, IBM came up with some really clever kind of ways to do this, and companies like Applied Materials stepped in and worked on this problem with other competitors to really make this a robust process. And this is one of the th key things that's enabled Moore's law to progress below half a micron uh, node. So <clears throat> I know it's possible for uh, people to come together. And the nice, actually one of the, the nice stories is this, after this was kind of figured out, Semitech um, stopped getting government money very quickly and it expanded to actually an international participation. So. What started in the U.S. is kind of an innovative way to solve common problems. Uh, quickly, you know, expanded to include all the major players internationally, and um, and it go. I think this is a great example to show that it, cooperation actually kind of floats all boats here. So, speaking of uh, cooperation, I want to end this talk as I do all of my talks with a slide of our ENM team because this is really where all this innovation and hard work comes from. Um, we have a great team and uh, I would invite anyone that's interested in kind of talking to us about <clears throat> materials informatics or data-driven methods in materials discovery and, uh, and uh, kind of vehicle electrification to reach out. Okay, uh, thank you. Abraham, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that amazing talk. I think there's a lot of very interesting ideas and uh, history that you have included in that. And I, I'd like to have a bit of a discussion. Maybe we can start with this idea of informatics and semitech. In fact, there's been a lot of parallels that have been made uh, or at least um, suggested between the ramp up in batteries now and the ramp up in semiconductors that happened uh, in the last century, the latter part of that. And informatics actually is in many ways is a example of some of the techniques that were pioneered in that space during that time. Uh, I'm interested in your thoughts regarding the parallel, given that you were actually involved and in part of that um, ramp up in semiconductors. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, thank you. That's a, a very good leading question. I appreciate that, Jimmy. Um, <laughs> so, I, I, you know, when I worked at Applied Material, um, semiconductor uh, manufacturing does use a lot of informatics. Um, I've thought about this a lot. You know, I think uh, 
semiconductor devices yield themselves well to, uh, they're well behaved, let's say, they're well defined, they yield the, themselves well to kind of analytical, uh, you know, governing equations, if you like, or, or um, uh, analytical kind of relationships between the, the inputs and, and outputs. And so uh, there's also a lot of kind of inventory and process step management. So I think informatics is, is a natural part of that. I think the thing about battery manufacturing um, is that it, it does require kind of uh, also deep knowledge, but it, it also requires a sort of um, heuristic knowledge. And there's a lot of knob turning in, in manufacturing. And I think some of the skepticism about uh, using informatics in, in battery, uh, battery manufacturing is that it's kind of like, well, you're, you're trying to impose this you know, analytical system on this system, which is not, particularly well behaved, you know, there's a lot of complexity in it. Uh, but I think with kind of, you know, these, this ability to, to uh, integrate and to analyze large and disparate data sets for, with things like machine learning, um, we've seen that it is definitely applicable in, in many, many, many cases. It, as I said before, it's hard. So I, I, I really feel that this is a good approach to take. And I think that in terms of asking about the parallels, I think it's 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 going to be different. It's going to be harder, but it will be equally rewarding. And you know, the semiconductor industry really runs on kind of informatics for manufacturing. Uh, you know, data is immediately accessible. And like I said, I I know that there are manufacturers in the U.S. at different scales that are already doing this, but in in kind of a non systematic way. And I think if I could say one thing here today, it's that we really need to get together and establish some, you know, some, some commonality about how we approach this. I, I hope that answered your question. Uh, it does, you know, and I, I appreciate you sharing uh, the parallel uh, and the challenges and differences between the ramp up and semiconductors, which were yeah. in many ways, a much simpler system because they're single crystals <laughs> and right. uh, primarily one, you know, one material throughout uh, which you're making changes to. Well, um, there are some parallels, though, because, you know, like modern semiconductors, and, and I think there's some plot somewhere that shows the number of different elements involved in semiconductors going from like, you know, you know, aluminum, phosphorus, boron, silicon, and arsenic to, you know, like they use tungsten and cobalt and, you know, copper and all sorts of stuff in, uh, you know, uh, in the number of elements in semiconductors has expanded. The kind of complexity of the devices is is greater than lithium ion batteries, but the complexity of interactions is is significantly less or more controlled, let's say. So okay. it's kind of fantastic. So I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna highlight some, I mean the, the call to create this data sharing community is fantastic. And uh, you know um, and you highlighted some of the challenges with that, you know, and even in Semitech in the very early days, I would say that Bob Noyce uh, has written many articles about, or you know, often reference how that was really difficult to bring these uh, potential frenemies or collaborators slash competitors together. Uh, yeah. And in some could credit the success of Semitech to Bob Noyce's personal connections and his force of personality. Uh, uh, in that same parallel, I'm curious uh, if you have thought about that, which I'm sure you have, but I'm giving you an opportunity to, <laughs> to sort of uh, imagine how this would come about in the same sort of environment where you have uh, companies which are investing billions of dollars and yeah. asking them to share information uh, that, you know, that they traditionally keep very close to the chest here. And, you know, with the risk reward that they will get more information to share and therefore everyone, everyone benefits and the tide goes up. What are your thoughts on how such a thing could come about and what would be the 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 force of this, the Bob Noyce equivalent <laughs> or, you know, the team of Bob yeah. Noyce equivalent that could make this come about? Well, first of all, I think, uh, you know, maybe this may be the highlight of my career that I mentioned in the same uh, breath as Bob Noyce. And anybody that knows me knows I have a very strong personality, but I'm no uh, Bob Noyce. So, um I think this is, yeah, it's going to take a lot of cajoling and convincing. And, and I did show you the Kumbaya picture of Semitech, but I know that, of course, you know, being in Silicon Valley, there's intense rivalries. But, but the deal was that, you know, Semitech allowed in large part for at least for American uh, 
manufacturers and, and then spreading international. It allowed people to continue following Moore's law and it allowed the expansion. Actually, the, the, the demand was there for increased applications involving semiconductors. <clears throat> you think about the world today versus the world of the 1980s, semiconductors were really, you know, had kind of limited application uh, in, 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 in the, you know, in the kind of like, um, you know, commercial space and the industrial space. Um, but that cooperation did in large part contribute to greatly expanded uh, production and, and consumption of semiconductors. And in the same way, <clears throat> we're projecting, and, and there will be a large market for lithium ion batteries, much larger than it's ever been, you know, yeah. orders of magnitude. And so I think there the parallel is exact and the benefit is exact too, right? Because it, it already costs a lot of money to make a car. And, you know, the, the battery pack, you know, manufacturers right now, if you want to say what the equivalent of the battery pack is the equivalent of the engine and the gas tank at the same time, um, you know, manufacturers are, that cost for a, an engine has been driven down. And also the quality and reliability has, has is really, really, you know, highly optimized. Um, so, you know, you're right, getting people who are nominally competitors to, to cooperate is difficult, but I think step one is to see that we're not, and at least in that space, we're not competitors, that there's a common benefit to all. And then the second thing is to figure out, to convince people how to cooperate, right? And that's where I think informatics really comes into play is because if you're, if you're already collecting this data, then there's, a, then, then you have to set, agree on a set of rules about how to share data. Okay. Maybe you have to agree on the human environment, you know, whether it's, it's consortia based or it's, you know, there's just a repository, how you share results, so on and so forth. Yeah. So uh, let's pivot a little bit and talk about um, Toda's immense investments now in scaling up of battery production here in the U.S. Yeah. And um, I mean, it's, it's clearly be, um, something that a lot of companies are now driving toward. And as Toyota is em embarking <clears throat> on this, what do you see as uh, some of the biggest challenges that you foresee in this scale up uh, that Toyota can see? But I would imagine probably similar elements would apply to many of the other companies that are building these, these battery factories. Yeah, well, <clears throat> I think, um, you know, there, there's two, uh, I, I'm not gonna, I, I think this is pretty true across the board. Even <clears throat> auto automotive OEMs that are building battery factories are partnering up with people who built them before. So for example, Toyota is partnering with Panasonic through PPES. Tesla has also partnered with Panasonic. Some companies are partnering with LG, Chem, you know, so on and so forth. There's not a lot of people that are going at this just, you know, complete greenfield. They've never made batteries before. But having said that, I want to reiterate a point I, I raised, which is that um, traditional battery manufacturing has relied a lot on experience of individuals in the plant. But if you have this many plants and then you go to that many plants, you can't clone those people, right? If experience is the, is the way that you manufacture batteries, it takes time to develop experience. And so that means for a long time, we're not gonna be operating at kind of peak efficiency. And so that's you know really, to drive the point home, you have to have tools that amplify, you know, smart, hardworking people in the factory. And, you know, Toyota has great, you know, Toyota has the, the Toyota Way, TPS, one of the, the greatest innovations in manufacturing since the assembly line. And a lot of people use things like lean manufacturing and, you know, Kanban systems. And so, you know, one of the things we really want to focus on is how to bring that quality uh, quality approach to manufacturing, the human approach, if you will, and combine that with data-driven uh, methods. And, and I, I think one way or another, people will eventually get to that same kind of conclusion that in the lack of having enough people, enough experienced people, they're going to have to start relying on, uh, you know, new innovative tools to do this. And of course, sharing really lowers that burden. If you, if you only have limited experience, and the, the number of people you need greatly expands. If you can share people's knowledge, you can kind of amplify the, the, that, that experience and knowledge of individuals. How you do it is 
somewhat up for debate. So uh, to the extent that you can share with us, um, how, how is Toyota planning to incorporate informatics in its factory in, in, the, in, in the way that you're describing? Well, this, this, is the, um, this is the unfortunate thing is I, I, I can't really share with you any of those, those details, even the ones that I think are fairly easy to get. But I do think Toyota, like other manufacturers in the 21st century, is very uh, interested, and this is publicly available, they're very interested in this kind of factory of the future or you know, factory 4.0, if you like. Uh, I, I, they're, they're receptive to this. Uh, because it's it's part of the Toyota way is is you know kaizen it's continuous improvement and um, I think you know informatics or, or factory of the future is excuse me is um, is the essence of kaizen so you uh, so you've you've kind of highlighted that uh, experienced people is one of the big gates uh, and. Um, I'm poking on that a little bit, uh, what about the experience of battery manufacturing uh, line workers or other things? Do, do, you know, sort of the. Uh, oh, no, that's, the... that's the experience I'm talking about. You know, you, you may have, you know, and, and again, I want to say that I know that there are companies where it's, a, it's much more of kind of, it's much more people have access to data and share data and, and learn models. But I, I think that's the exception rather than the rule. And again, this is because I haven't visited every battery manufacturer and some of this you have to kind of glean on the, on the, on the down low. But, but um, you know, I know it works where it's working, but I think the combination of discipline, sharing and data-driven informatics uh, processes are going to be uh, the key here. Okay, fantastic. Well, Abraham, I want to thank you uh, for your presentation and the discussion. And uh, we will now uh, turn <clears throat> turn to Kurt. Thank you. So, Kurt Kelty is the VP, uh, Vice President of Commercialization and Battery Engineering at Scylla, where he leads the sales and deployment of Scylla's materials. He brings more than twenty five years of experience in the battery industry, including eleven years at Tesla where he most recently served as the Senior Director of Battery Technology. He was responsible at Tesla for leading numerous key initiatives, including the batteries, <clears throat> the company's battery cell usage strategy, delivering the batteries implemented in the Roadster, Model SX, and Model 3, and leading partnerships and material sourcing efforts at the Gigafactory. Prior to Tesla, Kurt was Director of Business Development at Panasonic, where he founded the U.S battery R&D lab. Kurt holds a BA in biology from Swarthmore College and an MS from Stanford and is the author of 16 patents. So Kurt, welcome. And I will turn the stage over to you. Yeah, happy to be here. Uh, as, as you just heard, I'm Kurt Kelty uh, from CELA. Um, and uh, gonna talk a little, talk about our company, but just before starting, I've got a, a one minute video here to share. Hopefully this will come through and, uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll start explaining a bit more about our company. What would you do with more energy? With the power to enhance performance without compromising design? To take the driving experience further, faster, ever imagined. The future of electrification is here. And it's powered by SELA. Proven in market and backed by over a decade of research, our next generation battery materials are more powerful, smaller, flexible, and scalable. To meet the demands the road ahead, enabling you to charge faster, go farther, and unlock design without compromise. With Sela, move beyond limitations with the energy and performance to lead the charge and build the future of electric vehicles today. Yeah, so uh, you, you probably gathered from the video there, but um, 
a little uh, uh, a little bit about CELA, but let me tell you more. Um, first of all, our mission is really to power the world's transition to clean energy, and uh, what we're um, oh, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, that, that's our mission. Our vision statement here is to build an enduring company that tackles the toughest battery material challenges with science at scale. And so what we're doing uh, currently is uh, focusing on silicon anode material. Um, so that's what my uh, talk will be focused on today and manufacturing that uh, in the US and some of the challenges that we're facing. Uh, but before that, just a little more on the company. We were founded a little over 10 years ago, um, coming out, the technology came out of Georgia Tech. Um, and uh, two of the three co-founders uh, came out of Tesla. I also am uh, out of Tesla as well. Um, we do manufacturing in California today and in Washington uh, very soon. Uh, we've got roughly 350 employees. Uh, they're mostly based in Alameda, uh, where our headquarters is uh, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, so what, what we're making is uh, what we're calling Titan Silicon. Um, and it's a, uh, a nanocomposite material, um, nanocomposite silica material. The, um, uh, we are the only nanocomposite silica material that's in market today. Um, and you achieve about a, a 20 to 40% uh, increase in energy density, 20% uh, today, 40% in the future, um, which enables our OEMs to really differentiate uh, from others be, because they're getting the longer runtime, the faster charge. and. Uh, also quicker acceleration from this. Um, it is a drop-in replacement, and I'll focus a lot on that because that is, is just so important here for uh, an industry that is evolving as quickly as batteries are. To be able to have a drop-in replacement is, 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 is critical. Uh, there's no new CapEx required or anything like that. There's no pre-lithiation that's required either. Uh, we manufacture our material using only global... Uh, commodity items. So you can procure this from multiple companies, multiple countries around the world. Uh, and our manufacturing uses just bulk manufacturing techniques so we can scale this up and drive costs down uh, significantly uh, over the next many years. In terms of uh, performance of our materials, so today I mentioned uh, we get a 20% increase in energy density. Um, by the end of the decade, we expect to be achieving about a 40% increase uh, in energy density. So you can see here on the right, a chart showing uh, what uh, 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 cells can achieve with graphite. They're, they're basically kind of leveling out uh, in their energy density. And then uh, a comparison uh, with graphite with SIOX. That's what uh, uh, Tesla uses now with cells from Panasonic. Uh, I show here what solid state can uh, uh, eventually achieve. And then showing what you can achieve with Titan silicon material. Um, and then the, the, um, the orange part there is what uh, can be attained by other means uh, combined with the silicon material, like for, for example, improved cathodes. Um, and you can see here the, uh, the increase in energy density that can achieve, be achieved with all that combined together. Uh, so that's on the energy density side. Uh, the other thing that's really key here is the fast charge, where today we're getting about a 20 minute fast charge. And when we speak of fast charge, that's 10% state of charge to about 80%. Um, and in the future, we expect to get that down to about 10 minutes. And the beauty of this is that you don't get, you don't have to compromise anywhere else. You're not compromising in cycle life or safety or in temperature performance or anything like that. We're able to maintain all the other metrics and just improve these two. Uh, so what, what, where we are right now is um, uh, we're, we're manu whoops, sorry, uh, we're, uh, going to start auto scale production in 2025. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll start uh, over in, in 25 and over the next five years, really powering over a million vehicles. Um, so that's what we're uh, aiming for and to try and get into the mass market. So we're starting at the premium market, working our way down and eventually uh, hitting the mass market uh, towards the latter part of this decade. Uh, we believe strongly that we've got the best anode solution for both luxury and mass platforms. Um, the, uh, uh, we have a, a full graphite replacement that's more uh, optimized around luxury or premium. And then uh, uh, we can use a, a lower um, blend percentage for more of the mass market um, as we uh, focus on cost. Um, the, uh, in, the other thing that's important here, it's a drop-in replacement, as I mentioned. Um, so overnight, you can take a factory 
uh, and in increase the output by 20 percent. So you can go 10 gigawatt hours to 12 gigawatt hours overnight without any change in your capex, using the same equipment, using the same labor. Um, so it really uh, uh, is a, a a huge step for a uh, an existing factory. Um, this lists our investors. Uh, I just want to call uh, call this out mainly because uh, I mean the times like. Uh, we're going through right now where it's a difficult financial environment. Fortunately, we raised a lot of money in the past and we've got a lot of money in the bank. Uh, we've raised almost a billion dollars to date. Uh, we're the best financed battery material company ever. Um, and uh, yeah, we're in that fortunate position right now. So let me talk a little bit about uh, performance uh, and expectations in the market. Um, so th this chart uh, is a benchmark uh, chart showing, uh, or Bloomberg uh, chart showing the growth in um, uh, EVs that are forecasted out through 2040. I think everyone on this call is probably very familiar with that. It's a very steep growth plan. Um, and uh, as far as increased consumer adoption, uh, if you do surveys, um, you can see that uh, there's a lot of preference for EVs uh, today uh, as the next car for, for most, uh, most, uh, um, most buyers. And we actually commissioned our own survey. Uh, we we uh, had a third party do this. Uh, a thousand uh, respondents uh, were involved in it. 50% um, of them were EV owners. 50% uh, were planning to purchase EVs in the next year. Um, and you can see the results we, we got here, which were quite surprising to us. Um, the, fo the focus on battery is just uh, uh, really um, critical here. 75% uh, said they want to pay they, they're willing to pay more for a better battery. 89% um, agree that uh, uh, you, the, the better battery technology is something that would be very valuable. Um, and 79% rank the driving range as more, uh, more important than even fast charge. And we, we, we often think fast charge is super important. And, uh, and we also are uh, it's one of the benefits you get from using our material. But if you ask uh, uh, buyers what's more important, a, a longer driving range or faster charge, even if you make the difference $5,000, they still opt for the longer range. Um, and, and if you ask them how much they're willing to pay, uh, we, were, we were shocked by how much they're willing to pay for that extra range, roughly twelve dollars to $13,000. And we've got a, a detailed, this is on our website, so feel free to go, go check it out there. And the, all the details to this uh, survey are included there. Uh, so let, let me talk about the, uh, our material here. So as I mentioned, we've been in business over 10 years now. We've had a lot of material iterations over that time, so over 70,000 iterations where we make a material, test it, realize we got to make some changes, we'll go back to uh, do another run. Uh, so uh, over the years, uh, uh, we've had a, a lot of opportunity to test different materials. And um, as a result of that, we've also uh, been able to file a lot of patents. So we've got over 200 patents or patents pending uh, covering our material. We really are the, um, the, the sole owners of this nanocomposite uh, low swell silicon material. And uh, so anybody else out there that's planning to introduce a similar product uh, uh, like this will uh, most likely have to uh, license that technology from us. The, uh, I mentioned earlier about uh, replacing graphite completely uh, or also doing what we call a partial graphite replacement. So uh, the full graphite replacement is generally um, where you're tr trying to really maximize your energy density. So that's one uh, market we're going after. Um, the other thing is you could do with our material is do a partial replacement, where if you really try to optimize around some other metrics, uh, in, including uh, um, affordability, then you might want to go with a partial uh, graphite replacement. But either one, you can, you can do either one with our material, which we think is unique. Uh, we're not aware of any other company that can actually fully replace the graphite. Uh, now, if you look at other uh, companies or other competing technologies, we've kind of taken a chance to crack at listing this up here. Um, so it's silicon oxides, uh, those are present I mentioned earlier with, with uh, Panasonic and Tesla. Uh, silicon compounds and, and simple composites uh, is another technology out there, 2D electrodes, novel cell architectures, and then, uh, and then the incumbent, the graphite. Uh, that's why we've listed it up here on the left. And then we'll, the, the, 
along the top are what we think are the really important characteristics that you want to ask one of these if, if you're dealing with one of these companies um ask them these questions and find out what 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 boxes they check and what ones they don't um we've kind of broken it into performance and scalability so performance um can they do uh, low blends can they do medium sized blends or can they do a a complete replacement uh, of graphite and as you can see here like SIO, siox is in the market today the silicon oxides but it's only these low blends like 3% or 5% it can't be used in a 30% or 100% because the the swell is 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 too great so um so that's on the and then uh, another performance metric is this fast charge can you get fast charge out of it uh, with a high ved ved is the the um, the energy density, the volumetric energy density. So can can you get the two of those both uh, together um, is uh, uh, um, obviously very important. And then the other thing is on scalability. Um, can you readily scale uh, to the auto market? Um, can, can it drop in right today, in, right into the gigafactories? Um, and is it likely to qualify for IRA credits? Um, now you can some of these like graphite today roughly 90 percent of it comes from china so it's not going to be eligible uh, for the ira credits now there are opportunities to manufacture some of these materials in the us and if they do they, they will also qualify but the way it is today the majority of these materials are manufactured overseas and not uh, do not qualify for the ira credits um, let me talk about Sela's uh, material in market. So uh, this is the Whoop 4.0, and I've actually got one on as as well. Uh, many of our uh, my colleagues do as well. The uh, uh, this was introduced in September, almost two years ago. Uh, introduced to the market. We've got over a million of these now in the market by Whoop, and uh, they made a, an announcement when they introduced it that this was the first product using Sela's uh, silicon anode material, and with this, uh, by using our material, they're able to get a 17% increase in energy density uh, while still maintaining cycle life and all the other characteristics, including safety, uh, that were required for the, the program. Um, as I say, this has been going on for nearly two years. There's never been a quality issue or anything like that that we're aware of. Uh, it's been going very, very smoothly uh, for us over this period of time. Now, that, that was a, a, a partial replacement of, of graphite. We've also introduced a 100% replacement. And this is with another consumer electronics company. Um, they do not make any announcements regarding their supply base, so we're not allowed to make an announcement either. Um, but it's been in market now uh, uh, for almost a year um, with this premium consumer device. And uh, yeah, that, so that's, that's a, uh, an example of a complete replacement of graphite. Uh, we also had an announcement with Mercedes. Uh, this um, uh, was last year. They uh, announced that they're going to use Sela's material in their G class, um, the uh, otherwise known as the G wagon. Um, this they announced that this will be the world's highest energy density cell, um, boosting performance by twenty to forty percent. Um, you can see the cell level energy density they expect to achieve from this. Um, and this material will come from our Moses Lake facility, which I'll talk about a little bit later in our uh, in the presentation here. So let me talk a little bit about performance here. I give you some data. Uh, so we're not a cell maker. We we make silicon anode material. Um, however, we do need to make some cells in order to uh, validate uh, that the uh, the material is working. So what we make in house is a single layer pouch cell. Um, so as as the name says, it's single layer. So it's it's, it's tiny. It's uh, um, the the cells that we can do internally. But what we do is we work with external partners on all other form factors. So whether it's cylindrical, pouch, prismatic, big cells, um, we're uh, some of our we, we've had a couple of cells made over forty amp hours to date. I think the more recent ones are over hundred amp hours uh, as well. So we've we've had a lot of cells made different form factors. Um, and uh, generally, you can see here the typical uh, test cell design, and it depends on whether we're doing a blend or a um, or a, uh, a full replacement of graphite. Uh, you can see the capacity of our material, um, uh, the, the anode coating, the first uh, first cycle formation. So you can see the the relevant data here. Uh, and as far far as test results. Um, 
the uh, the big thing with silicon material is swell. Uh, that's the one reason it hasn't been commercialized to date. It's always been the swell. And the um, the Titan silicon will uh, it swells about the same amount as graphite. So graphite generally uh, out to a thousand cycles, it's roughly six, seven, eight percent swell, somewhere in that kind of a range. And you can see here. Uh, with uh, our, our Titan silicon that uh, we're able to keep it below 6% uh, out with with great, uh, with, with, with long cycle life. Um, and, and you can see on the right, uh, the cycle life that comes with that 20% increase in energy density, you're getting over a thousand cycles in, um, uh, in this particular application. Um, the, the, this, and this, well, the cycle life really is confirmation that we've got swell contained. So it's, uh, these, these go hand in hand with one another. Um, and then just to show you uh, a slide on fast charge, um, this is a, uh, you can see different charge rates starting with 1C, the green line, and then going to 2.8C with that orange line. That 2.8C is equivalent to, to 20 minutes. So that's the, um, uh, that, that's how we're doing the fast charging. And then on the right, you can see what kind of cycle life we get from it. And again, we're, we're, we're getting over a thousand cycles and with no impact uh, based on the different charge rates. So it's, uh, the material is, uh, is quite impressive for handling higher energy density and the faster charge. Uh, now, if you look at how this would be look in a vehicle, um, what, what the way we talk to our customers is that you can get a 20% increase in ener uh, energy density or range and over a thousand cycles and a le less than 30 minute fast charge. Um, so if you put it on a, a scale here where you're uh, uh, showing how much the um, how much a, an advantage it gives the OEM to have that extended range, you, you stack it up against the average uh, the, whether it's the average vehicle or the base pack that's already shipping with that vehicle, and it's a huge improvement. And then on the, the right side, you could see, again, the fast charge performance. You can stack it up versus competitors, and you get a, a huge reduction in that fast charge, which is really appealing uh, to the OEMs. Uh, switching gears a little bit, I uh, wanted to talk about, so that's on the performance side, and then uh, talking about um, uh, life cycle analysis, which is a, a critical element going forward, especially with our European OEMs, they're really focused on this number of um, what, uh, what what are the CO2 equivalents per kilowatt hour that are emitted from our material, and uh, especially in comparison to graphite. And you can see here, if you compare it with the synthetic graphite versus the natural graphite, you get these massive reductions in uh, in CO2 emissions. So, the, the, and we're able to achieve this because we've designed the material this way, because we have access to hydro. So our, our, our facility in Moses Lake um, that I'll talk about shortly is all uh, powered by, by hydro. Um, the, um, uh, and then the other thing is that we get such high capacity. So um, when, when you're doing this on a scale, we're comparing it again uh, with kilowatt hours, the CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour, which is the right metric to use. Because we get such high capacity of our, our material, it, it also enables us to get this, uh, this low CO2 emission number. Um, okay, let, let me uh, talk a little bit about how we deal with customers in the, uh, on the marketplace. So as I say, said, we do not make cells. We make the material that goes in cells. And so you would think normally that we would sell to a cell manufacturer. Um, but what, what we actually do is uh, we, we try to sell to the OEM uh, instead. And we work very closely with them uh, to understand what their requirements are because we can tailor not only our particle, but we can tailor our recipe because we have a, 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 an extensive um, team internally here at CELA where we're developing uh, recipes that have the best electrolyte, the best binder, the best additives, so that we, when we uh, can work with a customer, we, we give them a whole recipe, not just, we're not throwing our material over a wall and saying, here, here you go. We're working very closely with them. And so we, we wanna work closely with that OEM to understand what their requirements are to really tailor a solution for them. <clears throat> then, the um, uh, we we had, then get introduced to the cell manufacturer by that OEM. Um, we end up doing a lot of work with that cell manufacturer again with that with the recipe to make sure that um, that 
they've got the best recipe to optimize around our material. Now we're not a cell manufacturer, so we're not an expert in making cells, but we are an expert in using our material. So we can give them our material with a recipe that works great. They then take that and because they're experts in cell manufacturing, they can tweak that design and really optimize it uh, in a way that we're, we're not capable of doing. So they take it to another level. The, um, uh, and then the, uh, uh, um, so we, we end up working very closely together, the three parties to, to get a, an optimized solution. We end up shipping the material to the cell manufacturer, um, supporting them, our warranties with the cell manufacturer, uh, but a lot of our early work is, is with the OEM. Um, I mentioned earlier about the drop-in replacement uh, capability, and this is showing a typical uh, lithium ion factory starting with a mixing. You can see on the bottom left here, you got the cathode and the anode separated. It goes from mixing to coating to calendar and slid in to stacking. So that's the, the typical process in, in manufacturing. And what we're talking about is just look at that orange area where the, uh, uh, the anode uh, is, uh, is the copper uh, color of copper there. Um, and so the only thing we're changing is that mixing area. And we're not changing the equipment. All we're doing is changing the input. So you're, you're, you're changing one black powder for another black powder. And it goes into the hopper and mixes up and, uh, and then goes on the line. Now we're changing parameters. So the levers are changed on the equipment. And some of the other, um, what we call co-products are changed as well. For example, the electrolyte will be a different electrolyte. The additive will be a different additive. Um, so you're, you're, you're getting uh, some changes in the inputs, but not in the equipment. So that's why you can get this huge increase in output overnight um, in the same factory. And from this, you can get a great increase in revenue from IRA credits, and I'll talk about that later. Um, I'm going, going to go through this a little bit quickly because I'm going to run out of time here. We want to increase, or, um, when we're talking to cell manufacturers, we increase the factory output, low emissions. It syncs with their supply chain and it's fully compatible uh, with their uh, existing facilities. Um, I mentioned earlier about the, the IRA. So this is, there's two elements, the IRA that are relevant uh, with uh, the anode material. One is this 45X production tax credit. Uh, so this is, as many of you know, um, U.S. companies that qualify, or uh, North American companies that qualify, um, the, uh, uh, actually, I'm sorry, it's U.S.-based companies qualify, get this $45 per kilowatt hour credit uh, for uh, manufacturing um, uh, when they're in, in, in the U.S. And if you then use sealess material, as I mentioned, you're getting a 20% increase in output. So it's essentially an increase in $9 per kilowatt hour right off the top, just by switching to our material. So it almost pays to use our material. I'm exaggerating a bit, but you, you, you get the point that there's a, a, a real advantage to, to using domestically made uh, sealess silicon material. And then uh, uh, likewise in 30D, the clean vehicle credit. So this is another uh, credit that's, um, uh, that um, is available um, from North American, um, uh, components that come from North America. Um, this is the $7,500 credit. Um, and just to point out that, um, again, graphite over 90% comes from China today. And so vehicles with this battery active materials sourced from or refined by foreign entities of concern, such as China, are, are disqualified from the 30D credits. So again, there's a benefit by having domestic manufacturing um, using our domestically made uh, anode material. Um, we manufacture using the highest quality standards. Uh, ISO, we've already received the ISO certification. Uh, we're in um, uh, process to get our IATF uh, certification. Um, we're building a, a, just a first-rate team here uh, in Alameda that will eventually transfer up to Moses Lake. Uh, here's our facility in Alameda. You can see the, uh, the four buildings here. Um, we, we do our, uh, in the second building here that's labeled manufacturing, that's where our uh, powder is, is made, the uh, silicon nanomaterial. Then the building on the lower left, that's where we assemble it. Um, we do coatings and we assemble it into single layer pouch cells. Uh, and the two buildings on the up, upper part are our office buildings. So it's a, it's a nice campus uh, in Alameda, just uh, about uh, 20 minutes away from San Francisco. 
and then um, uh, I'm going to talk about Moses Lake next. So uh, the the facility, though, in Alameda, we've got these three lines that you can see here on the left. So we have our R and D line. Um, that's where we've done our seventy thousand iterations. We've got our pilot line, and then we've got the Alameda plant um, line. So that's the Alameda plant line is the one that's producing all our material for validation today. And then we've got Moses Lake uh, facility, and that's going to start up. Um, we'll have first powder uh, towards the end of 2024, and then the start of production uh, will be in Q2 of 25. And then we're going to rapidly expand uh, from there once we get the first line uh, up and running. Uh, this is a picture of our Moses Lake facility. Um, so the um, uh, we've added drawings. So the uh, you can see the out uh, outdoor um, equipment uh, in the upper picture. That's all a rendering. Uh, the building exists is what it looks like uh, today. Um, and then in the bottom picture, you can see the, uh, uh, again, some of these outdoor uh, equipment that those have been added in. Those do not exist today, but the building does exist. It's a 600,000 square foot facility on a bunch of land. Um, our key raw materials are located uh, nearby, uh, the, the main material right across the street from us. So that's, uh, that's really helpful. Uh, it's also all powered by hydro. Um, we, we've got a rail line coming into the facility as well. Uh, so it's really a, a, a great facility. It's about 10 years old, the building, um, and uh, it actually never got used. Uh, two, two different companies owned it, but uh, uh, yeah, we're the first ones that are actually planning to um, in install our equipment and start manufacturing there. Uh, just a, uh, again, looking at this, so we're gonna have two facilities, roughly 150 gigawatt hours worth of production uh, by the end of 2028. Um, and you can see the, the different facilities and their characteristics. Um, I, I wanted to add a little bit here on manufacturing domestically um, and uh, some of the challenges we've uh, faced um, as manufacturing in the US right now. I think the big thing is that there's just a massive amount of um, factory construction right now. Uh, there's $200 billion have been committed domestically over the last year, um, and that's being driven by uh, IRA as a part of it, and also there's pent-up COVID demand. That $200 billion number, that number is normally around 70, um, and so that, that, that's huge demand, and what, what the impact of that is that it's driving up uh, costs of uh, equipment and driving lead times, um, so the lead times are longer which is really, it's painful for us and uh, painful for all the other companies out there that are also trying to scale up right now. And it's causing shortages of, of contract labor and higher rates for that contract labor. Um, the other thing is that uh, um, it's, uh, the, the challenges we have that are more localized is uh, electricity demand is also high. And so uh, it's taking this longer lead time in, in building factories to make sure you have enough electricity there. Um, we've had good luck with our permitting agencies, uh, but state EP, EPA and AP air permitting are still the, the long poles uh, out there. So um, we, we still have to deal with that. Um, and then there is concern about operational labor shortage um, in the Moses Lake area. It's not a huge uh, city, uh, but we're partnering with area schools and trying to recruit and train the local talent there. And then if... Um, uh, uh, one of the, the advantages that we have, though, compared to other companies that are trying to do this, we're, we're really fortunate. Um, first of all, we make a powder that's it's non-toxic, it's got long shelf life, easy to handle, easy to ship. You put them in 500 kilogram uh, super sacks and you can ship them around the world. So it's real easy to ship. So that means we don't have to be located right next to our uh, cell manufacturing partner. Um, we also don't use any raw materials for uh, foreign entities of concern. Um, we, they don't, we don't need that many employees. It's essentially a chemical factory. And so we can make a lot of material with very few employees. So we're, we're lucky that we don't have that huge problem of, of labor, uh, have, needing a big labor pool nearby. Um, and then we don't have anything nasty that's being emitted uh, from our factory. So the permit process is relatively easy for us. Um, and then as, as far as usage, there's a big attraction using our material because roughly 90%, as I say, come from China today, the graphite. 
um, and we're displacing that. So lots of the cell manufacturers just really want to use our material and they use it, want it quickly. And, and it's and doubly important that drop-in replacement is, is super important so that they can just switch over really quickly. So there's no like a long-term switching costs that are involved here, which is a benefit uh, that we have uh, compared to other companies that are entering the battery material ch supply chain. Uh, summary slide here, again, we're going into scale, auto scale production 2025. We think we've got the best anode solution for both luxury at that high end, as well as the mass market platform uh, towards the latter part of this decade. 20% um, more gigawatt hour output, really limited development work required for that. So lo lots of reasons to, to make that switch over. With that, I'll end it. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for that presentation, Kurt, and that summary of uh, both CETA's technologies and uh, the ramp, which is very exciting to see. Uh, it must be very exciting for you guys as you uh, as you have your capacity increased by 100x. Um, one of the things that I have as a beginning question, which I thought was uh, really interesting, is that you actually work with the OEMs and you fine tune uh, your materials and process to make sure that you create the material that the OEM that maximizes the OEM's interest. Um, so. Are you able to, so when I think about that, I think that you might have different formulations or different processes for different OEMs. And if that's accurate, how do you do that within the same factory? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you're asking that because I, I should correct that. So initially we're gonna, our hope is to really have one particle at the beginning, one material, and then gradually we'll we'll add more as we optimize around it for for each, um, uh, for other customers. But uh, uh, the, um, uh, and, and what we're doing is we're using that one material, but we're optimizing a recipe around that. So they, they, the loading may be different of our anode material. There's, there's a lot of different levers we can pick in the cell design process, which will opti uh, enable us to optimize around whether it's energy density or cycle life or, um, uh, or fast charge. So there's a lot of different levers we can, we can pull on the cell design side that we do internally at CELA when we're uh, addressing both the OEM and the, and the cell manufacturer. I see. So currently in your Alameda facility, do you just run one material and one process or do you Correct. actually play around? Yes. I'm glad you're clarifying that. Yes. It's just, it's one process. It's one particle that we're making right now. Now we've got, uh, as, as I mentioned, we've got the R and D line. So we're making all sorts of other materials that we are also testing. Uh, we're testing with our, our partners as well. So that it's just not in uh, large quantities. Um, but we do we do make a lot of different particles to figure out which what what particle is the best that's uh, optimized for our customers. All right, fantastic! Uh, it's very exciting to see sort of a scale up of what I would call a non traditional uh, or potential for non traditional lithium ion batteries, which is what makes this very exciting. As um, Abraham was just alluding to, uh, scaling up of a a battery facility is a big undertaking, which is in many, why in many cases they partner with someone who has that experience or that work experience or that know-how in order to help them scale. So to see a company like CELO, which is doing something different is and scaling that up is, is very, very exciting. Um, so with that idea in mind, um, are you finding that um, you're able to already have demand for the amount of capacity that you're putting in place and you know how are you how are you uh, sizing your factory uh, and what goes into that decision oh boy that's that's a good question uh jim the uh, uh so uh and, and it's a good question because it's kind of a chicken and egg where the um this the oems they've got these long development cycles. They're like five-year development cycles. They go from A samples, B samples, C samples. Uh, each one of these is roughly a year long, and uh, it, it's a long, drawn-out process. And they don't want to commit to anything until they've actually seen the final product. Um, yep. and so, you, so, so once they see the final material, then they're like, okay, let's start the validation process. But that's way too late. If they wait until they see the final material, that's... That, that'll be uh, from Moses Lake in 2025. Um, and uh, and so th then they start e-sample so they can deploy it in a vehicle in 2030. Well, that doesn't make sense. The, uh, um, and, and so it's, uh, uh, and th th this is, I think, a difference between some of the OEMs versus others. Uh, for example, I mean, my experience is at Tesla, Tesla is very quick. 
and adopting something. They're not going to wait until the final material is is out there and validated. And I think what's what's interesting is that that because Tesla's in the market and putting this pressure on everybody else, so there Tesla's like, well, you got a great material. Well, I'll test it for a few months. Looks good. Let's put it in the market. I mean, that, that's that's the mentality we had at Tesla when I was there. Um, you don't do a five years validation. You do validation to make sure it works, and you're validating all along the previous versions. And so when you get a couple, uh, get several months of data, um, and it looks very similar to the previous material that had this extensive testing done on it, then you, you feel really confident that it can go into the market. Now you got to do your safety testing. You got to do uh, there's a certain minimum amount you have to do on that actual material. But the longer term testing, as long as you can you, you can say, hey, it's really similar to that previous material. So I'm going to take that previous material results and apply it here. So that's that's kind of the the, the mentality they used at Tesla when I when I was there. Um, and the uh, that, that's putting pressure on the traditional OEMs, which didn't really want to start that until they had the final material. And so that now they're they're adjusting. And and so when we're working with OEMs, normally it would be okay from that a uh, a sample, give us final material. Well, why don't we give give our current material? It may not be the the final material, but let's let's use our current material. You start the validation process that way. And and so how far in that? A samples or B samples or C samples, how far in there can you go with your current production that's not the final material before you switch over to that final material? And that, that's a, uh, it's a real challenge to, for the traditional OEMs to kind of change their way of thinking, uh, to be more nimble, to be able to adopt the latest technology. Um, and, and it's fascinating to see them evolve over time becoming more and more nimble, more like Tesla. And if they don't, they're going to get crushed in the market because you can't, I mean, if, if Tesla is going to put things in, in, in the market a year or two years before others, because they're, um, they're, they're, they're um, accelerating their testing, um, boy, they're going to have a huge advantage over others. And that, that advantage is there today. Um, and uh, well, I assume it's there because of my past history at Tesla. Um, but uh yeah, so the, the, working working this out and getting those um, qualifications done in time so that when we hit production in 2025, we've actually got customers for that material. And working that schedule out and that including the validation is, is a real challenge, Jim. And without getting into some confidential discussions, I can say that we're we're uh, we're scaling uh, it, our Moses Lake facility in a way that will meet our customer needs that we've already. Uh, reached agreement on um, that they're going to buy a certain amount of material. So we're we're scaling um, as we we're, we're scaling appropriately for the customers that we have lined up uh, for uh, Moses Lake. Well, that's a fantastic story. Uh, given you know part of the way I think of that is the level of risk that companies are comfortable with, and yeah. based on their uh, exposure, uh, they have to make decisions based on that and. Uh, it used to be in the automotive industry where the level of risk was tolerance for risk was very low. Yes. So that's why they had such uh, very rigorous, uh, long periods of adoption. And it's great to see that that is now being um, changed as these new technologies come in place. And um, and they the new technologies are coming fast and furious. So this yeah. is, as I mean, as far as that, you know, what I can see, this is going to become more the norm uh, for a certain level of risk tolerance that uh, people are seeing. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about supply chain, because mm -hmm. in many ways you're a critical supplier for a critical component that goes into these batteries. And uh, as you pointed out, the vast majority of the animal materials comes from China. And that's one of the big... Uh, big questions right now is how do we how do we become more independent in that space <clears throat> so in that vein one of the questions i have for you is um <clears throat> how do you see sila um and what will sila do to sort of uh establish confidence that you know that well, how do you use that uh, that particular uh aspect in a lot of your discussions yeah, so um, none of our raw materials come from any foreign entities of concern. So that's a, a real uh, bonus for us. 
Um, and we're replacing materials that do come from foreign entities of concern. And so it's it, for when we talk to our customers, it, it's a, a no brainer in many respects um, that they want to switch to domestically made higher performing material. It, it's just it's really, really simple for them. The, the challenge that we have right now is we're not proven yet. Uh, we have not scaled up. Now we've we scaled up twice, 100x both times going from the R&D line to the pilot line and then to our Alameda factory line. So we've, we've done that scale up twice, 100x each time. And we're doing another 100x one going to our facility uh, at Moses Lake. So we, we've done it twice before, but it still is a, uh, uh, it's, it's a big jump. And, uh, and our customers are not completely comfortable until we actually uh, produce that uh, from there. So although they're excited uh, in, in terms of um, dropping reliance upon uh, materials coming from those foreign entities of concern, um, we, until we actually prove ourselves, it's not that slam dunk that I was originally referencing. Um, they, you, you've, you've got to get, you've got to be able to produce. And then the, the, the third pillar there, uh, I mean, we've already shown the performance work, so that's, that's already checked that box, but the, the one, the other issue is the affordability side. And as I say, we're coming in at that premium end, and then we're going to gradually work our way down to the, uh, mass market so that, uh, we will be cost competitive graphite, uh, towards the latter part of the decade. And then at that point, it, going back to my slam dunk uh, statement, it is a slam dunk at that point. We will have proven ourselves. Performance is better than graphite. Cost matching it. Um, domestic manufacturing is simplified supply chain. Uh, lower LCA. I mean, there's all these benefits. The the battery pack is smaller. The battery pack is lighter. You get fast charge benefit as well. I mean, there's just no reason to use graphite. It, it's just a matter of how much material can we make. Okay, fantastic. You know, so one of the one of the things that it's so coming to some of the audience questions, one of the questions that is from the audience is uh, how does the consumer electronics qualification differ from the automotive? And I'm, I want to ask that because that is also word, word word for word verbatim from the um, from the audience. But I have a follow up question to that after you. So please. Yeah. Ask. So we, we've uh, as I mentioned, we, we got into the whoop device uh, first. And one of the big reasons for that is that the qualification period is much quicker. I mean, I talked about this five-year period for autos. For consumers, it's roughly a year. And so you can, you can get in there really quickly. You can get in there with a small amount of material, and you can charge a lot of money for it. Um, so for those three reasons, we went with consumer first. It's, it's just it's so much faster, that validation period. period. So um, yeah, that 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 that's a, it's a nice nice target for us. But the volumes there, it's not you can't build a business off of that. It's it's right. just the the volumes are tiny. I mean, you, you put all the consumer devices together, uh, and oh, oh, we sold everybody. It replaced all the graphite consumer devices. It, it would still not be as great as one EV program. It's just yeah, not even, yeah, yeah. The uh... So that that's actually a great example. It's one of the big challenges that I see right now is that there's a need for fast cycles of learning, and yeah. that has to turn over really quick. But there's yeah. also a need to demonstrate scalability and product consistency and uh, performance at scalability. And so having to to do both is a challenge. And so what I'm hearing from you is that one of the ways that you achieve that is that you have these cycles of learnings for some of your consumer products to hone your formulation and everything else, by which then you can have an established, uh, established history by which now you can go and uh, go for the, the more challenging scalability demonstration question. Oh, I wish I could have stated it the same way, Jim. That, that, that's, that's exactly right. The, uh, with the amount of learnings, and then we did this purposely because taking something from lab and actually making it into a product and starting to ship it, you have so much stuff you haven't considered before, like, like the consistency. You've got to have, every lot's got to be identical. Uh, you've got to have quality programs in place. There's, there's all these things. So that jump from the lab to mass production shipping to customers is a huge jump. And so that so when we introduced this, it, it, it was a big deal. Um, yeah. the, uh, now, we've got another big deal coming up when we scale up at Moses Lake, but th this is, we, we've, we've, we've gone through one of these big milestones, these big hurdles, and we've come across, co come out of it looking good. And we've learned a lot from it, as you, as you say, Jim, lots of learning ahead, but we've, uh, we've accomplished a bunch. Fantastic. Kurt, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. And 
What I'd like to do now is to bring Abraham back. Fantastic. So um, what I think is, I'll start with, there's a key question, Abraham. In fact, you yourself um, were describing this, which is one of the one of the key things that you hope for this new factor of the future is the ability to incorporate new materials <laughs> as part of this or new advancements, right? And certainly in the... Uh, in the spirit of like uh, Intel and semiconductors, there's this copy exactly, don't change, you know, change control. I mean, which was really very challenging. So for new materials, like what Seed is producing and stuff, uh, how do you see Toyota's factory as you build it, incorporate new advances, changes and materials and being able to do that efficiently and quickly? So, yes. Uh, thanks, Jimmy. A good question. And I want to thank Kurt for, uh, you know, his talk dovetailing very nicely into the point I was trying to make about being nimble and adaptive. Um, so, you know, I, I can't speak for, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm an employee of Toyota, so I can't speak overall for the policy. Um, but I, I, I can reiterate my my position from coming from a long background of material science development in lithium ion batteries. And really, you know, as an engineer, as a working scientist, not understanding why these cool materials we're doing can't immediately be integrated into uh, production. Um, but I, I, I do want to say that I want to echo one of Kurt's comments that it's a very good strategy to kind of get in into a market where there's much more rapid adoption and then use that as a sort of development platform to say, hey, we're, we're, we've validated you know, scale to a certain extent and we're ready to go in. But I, I, I think it goes back to this, this incredible aversion to risk, especially in automotive battery production because the, the margins are gonna be much lower and there's a lot more on the line, right? Failures are, you know, when you have a thousand cells and one of them fails, and that takes out, you know, ten thousand dollar pack or fifteen thousand dollar pack. It's it's critical. So I I get you know why automotive OEMs are hesitant to do that, but I I think the again the emphasis on having new techniques to to really mitigate that risk by uh, by predictive algorithms about performance or even you know monitoring it and continuous prediction in a vehicle, for example. Um, will will mitigate that and i all i can say about toyota is that they are really one of the reasons that toyota research institute was formed is to try to understand how to use new emerging uh, technologies like machine learning or i guess science really to to gain a, a, a sort of to to enhance toyota's already formidable uh, reputation at manufacturing so for sure toyota is open to that and of course, one of the reasons is, um, you know, is to be able to adopt new materials like Sila's, uh, you know, Sila's anode product. And definitely people are interested at Toyota and, and specifically at TMNA in looking at new materials because we acknowledge the supply chain, um, the supply chain challenges. And we also understand, you know, the reason we're manufacturing batteries is to take advantage of things like IRA, and if the materials are produced domestically, that's a big plus, right? Yeah, thank you, Abraham. I mean, it's an exciting and terrifying time right now, at least from my standpoint, where I look at them like, wow, we're going to be having an incredible ramp. I mean, you know, if you just yeah. take a look at the projections for vehicles and the necessary supply chain volumes necessary to meet that, not even the raw critical minerals, minerals yeah, for that, it's, you know, it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's a little bit bewildering on you know how are we going to make all that happen and, i uh, i you know i i want to <laughs> yeah i i came in as like you know hot shot battery person and when you see the challenges actually involved at scale in manufacturing and you know like building a factory i've seen some pictures i showed you a picture of the, the site in north carolina i often feel just overwhelmed like who, who am i to kind of you know take on this kind of task but it's, it's not going to be me. It's going to be lots of people, you know, doing this. Kurt, people like you know, companies like Sila, all sorts of. You're, we're going to need all sorts of of, of people and, and innovative solutions to do this. So I'm just content to try to, you know, 
push something that I know uh, is effective, but it is, it's really overwhelming. And I, I do feel overwhelmed at times just because of the nature of the challenge, but you know, one, one foot in front of the other and you get through it. Yeah, I, I actually was going to um, ask Kurt about that. You were involved with the Gigafactory and Panasonic uh, and getting that off the ground. Um, what's your what's your experience from that? Especially what you know, what do you bring on that from that when you're talking about scaling Sela? And also a follow up to that is you're on the front lines of learning of how to scale a, a one factory, but now we're talking potentially many factories. And uh, what do you see as some of the big challenges for all these factories that are in the works? Boy, that's a, that's a, that's a big question. The uh, yeah, so I just for background, so I was um, really instrumental in getting the Gigafactory built in in Reno. Um, that was a in 2013 is when we identified uh, how many vehicles we would be making. The, we we estimated how many Model Three vehicles we would need what we were planning to make and how much, how many kilowatt hours, actually gigawatt hours we'd need. And we figured we needed 33 gigawatt hours per year of batteries in order to meet the demand by 2018. We were late. I think it ended up being 2020 or so that we needed that much. But at the time in 2013, that was the total lithium ion production worldwide. And we, we were forecasting that by 2018, we would need the whole worldwide production. And Elon looked at that and said, that's ridiculous. There's no way that anybody will, will be able to meet our demands. Because uh, we had already been working with Panasonic, with Sanyo, and with others. And trying to convince them to ramp up was just really, really hard. They, they, they were ramping. But when you ramp in the battery industry back then, you, you, you ramp you 5% a year, 10% a year, you do something like that. And we're talking about uh, double tripling over, over a couple of years. Um, and so that, that's when Elon decided, you know, we got to get in the battery business. And he said, we're, we're going to, we're going to make batteries. And my, at first my reaction was, oh man, what a disaster. What a mistake. There's no way in hell we're going to make batteries. It just wasn't in Tesla's DNA. I mean, we're it, to make, to make batteries for those on the call that have seen batteries made, it is, it is so hard. It is so hard to make a battery cell in good quality. And you got to do this not just once, not just a hundred times or a thousand times, not even million times, it's billions of times. You've got to make this exactly the same and you can't make a mistake. And Tesla was still trying to get the alignment right on the, on the front fender. And it, the, uh, uh, and it, it just, that wasn't what we were, we were known for. And it, it's, it was chemistry, right? It, was, it wasn't mechanical, it's chemistry, totally different. It wasn't electronics. It, chemistry. So it wasn't something we were good at. And so I argued back uh, with Elon saying, no, we, we shouldn't do this. And uh, I, I, I argued and I lost. Uh, and I argued again, my general principle here is that you can argue twice against your boss. Uh, and then you then you're gonna have to have to give up. I argued twice, I lost. And I was like, okay, let's try and work within the parameters he gave me. And so that's when I brought Panasonic in. Uh, I'm just like, okay, uh, and, and I had worked previously with Panasonic for 15 years, so I, I knew them well. And the same guys I used to work for uh, or work together with, they were the ones that led the team. And so we ended up working together, Panasonic and Tesla, and ended up building uh, the Gigafactory. Because this building factories is a, a, just a huge uh, challenge. And, the, you know, we've got these announcements that come. It's like every other week there's an announcement, whether Samsung or LG or whoever is, is coming up with their their factory that they're going to build in North America. And we don't have the workers for this. We don't have the expertise for this right now. Um, and so it's going to be really challenging. I mean, what, what we did at Panasonic in those early days is we ended up bringing a whole bunch of people over from Japan. They, they had to do this. And I'm sure Toyota, Abraham's team is probably doing the same. They're going to bring a whole bunch of people over. Um, you, 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 you would be shocked at how many people we brought over from Panasonic um, to, to really help out in that ramp. And they didn't just help out in the, they, I mean, they help out in the construction, in the commissioning, and then in the ramp, and they didn't go home then. There was still, I mean, there's just so many lingering issues that had to be solved over time. And so you need that connection back to your, uh, um, that parent company that has experience. So LG and Samsung and Panasonic can build these factories in the States because they're bringing people from Japan. But the rate that this is being announced right now, I don't know how they're going to do it because I mean, like Panasonic's talking about three factories in the US. And how do they, how are they going to have enough people to do this? And LG has got multiple factories and, and, S, and Samsung as well. Um, 
so it's going to be a real challenge. I mean, we, they, they, it's one thing to make an announcement, but it's another thing to actually come through and deliver on that. And uh, they're, they're going to be, each one of these companies is going to really be stretched because they just don't have enough people that know how to do this. Um, so I, uh, I, I mean, I'm optimistic in the sense that we, we solved it at the Gigafactory, or Panasonic solved it at the Gigafactory with a lot of help from Tesla um, doing that together. But um, yeah, we're going to have to replicate that over and over and over again and uh, cross our fingers and hope that, uh, that we get across the finish line here. But uh, there's a lot of challenges in the industry for the next several years on this. Yeah, and so what you just described is experience from Japan on existing technology. It's not even experience from Japan on new materials and other things like uh, what SELA is doing. So in that vein, um, at the Gigafactory, was there introduction of new materials or how was changes or what, you know advancements incorporated uh, as part of the operations in a way? Because Abraham's referring to that, you're referring to that. You know, We're all talk talking about control, but yet taking a greater risk as we introduce unknowns or new materials. So how, in your experience at Gigafactory, did you balance that? Yeah, so we we had a timeline and working right to left, we, we knew how much time we had to get that uh, production up and running. And it did not lead to the innovation that we were hoping for. For example, if, if we had more time, we could have developed the equipment, we being Panasonic and Tesla together, uh, developing improved equipment, whether it's winding machines or electrolyte fill stations. If we had a few more months, we could, do that, but instead we we were, because we were working against timeline, we ended up uh, limiting the amount of innovation that we did introduce at uh, at the Gigafactory. So we ended up we ended up copying a lot of what was done in Japan and and made some m minor improvements on things um, uh, at, at the Gigafactory. But the scale, since then, I think they, I, I've heard they've added multiple lines. I'm sure they've made huge improvements on on those. Uh, one of the advantages, though, of, of Sela's material is it doesn't require any change. You just use that same line that you were planning to do, use that same line, and you can start with graphite. I mean, it, I, I think if you're going to start a new factory, just do it with what's known well. Just start start with your graphite, if you if that's what you're doing. If you're already using sealess uh, material, then start with that. But start with what you know well, and then convert it over. There's, there's nothing, it, it doesn't require any any change in equipment. So that that's, again, the beauty of our, of, of our material. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Abraham, I have a I have a question for you as a, as a veteran of the semiconductor industry. Um, companies like Applied Materials uh, played a key part, I believe, in this whole ramp up because they ended up doing a lot of the equipment development, but also the process development. And they were instrumental in laying, doing a lot of that uh, heavy lifting. In the case of battery manufacturing, is there an equivalent in your mind to like the applied material that's, you know, that, that role, do you see that or do you see that as an opportunity? You know, um, <clears throat> equipment vendors, so what I know is that in the battery manufacturing space, equipment vendors don't do a lot of process development, at least not that I, I, I've seen, and maybe Kurt can correct this or back this up. So there isn't that kind of relationship where equipment vendors are integral to uh, to um, to production, and for example, applied materials will work. You know, because they sell to everybody. What they'll do is they'll work. They'll they'll have a, a a marathon, right? Where they'll they'll produce you know a certain number of wafers with a process to demonstrate to the customer, and the customer customer will provide that spec, but it's not necessarily the spec they're going to go to market with, because they they want to kind of keep those separate. But it's sufficient to prove it, and um, I think because the integrated nature uh, of, of batteries, it's hard to decouple process steps. So the validation really is done on the complete production. Mm. Um, and so uh, where you can introduce new materials like a, a new liner, you know, some variant of, of tantalum nitride, you can do it at unit process. I think it's much harder to demonstrate unit process in, in, in batteries uh, simply because the, the nature of how things are integrated is much more complicated because of you know chemistry. You're moving atoms around, not electrons in a battery. Um, oh, you're moving electrons too, but you're moving electrons and atoms. And you have these you know kind of multiple you know your liquid solid interface, solid state diffusion, you know diffusion in a liquid, 
temperature effects, all these kind of things. It, it, it's kind of it's it's kind of hard to do. However, I think there is an opportunity for equipment makers to make new equipment that uh, solves, uh, for example, uh, you know, like the prelithiation problem or improvements in equipment. Um, there there isn't a lot of um, you know, I want to reflect something that uh, Kurt said again, which is that, yeah, the Pan Panasonic is going to come to the US and help get the factory up and running. But again, they can't just, they don't just check out, you know, on the day that, you know, the, the factory is running at whatever nominal production rate or, 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 or yield it is, they have to stay because that methodology, that, that school of thought is really, you need that experience. You can't make the handoff until the people that you're supporting have the same level of experience. Now, I, um, you know, and, and again, this is why we want to institute a data-driven methods right from the beginning, because that, you know, we can train people on that fairly rapidly and use their already, you know, people's good intuition and, and experience with the process and, and amplify that uh, through, through kind of informatics. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic, Abraham. Kurt, do you have anything uh, what what is your experience from the Gigafactory regarding equipment makers? Yeah, so it's interesting. In in the past, um, Panasonic um, actually had an own division that they would develop their own equipment for them. So it was all vertically integrated. Um, and uh, uh, over time, what happened is Panasonic. See, Panasonic used to be a dominant force in the battery industry, so they would give big orders to the equipment team. But gradually, the mm -hmm. they became more and more a minor player um, and these other companies they were just focused on equipment could manufacture a lot more they had bigger volume bigger throughput and then and exposure to different customers and so uh, I think they ended up learning faster and driving down costs faster than Panasonic divisions could and so Panasonic ended up uh, switching their strategy to buying externally except for one or two uh, there's two key elements that they would keep in house, uh, um, in which I, I can't share. But um, the other ones they would buy externally, and so by keeping those two in house, they were able to keep uh, advancing the process development there and work very closely with their internal uh, team on that. Um, but the the external one, they would end up work with, with the external partners. I think there'd probably be less collaboration with them, and I'm not in. Panasonic now, so I don't know exactly how that's working, but uh, um, it, it, as Abraham said, the, uh, uh, the, the the process innovation, I think, is uh, is a bit challenging for the equipment makers, unless they're working really closely with that cell maker, and uh, uh, so I'm, I'm not really sure how they're doing it today. Uh, I mean, vertically integrated has those advantages, but you have the drawbacks of it's generally going to be more expensive. So do you also share Abraham's uh assessment that currently uh, the way the way you're the process development is difficult to do in a unit because the output really the only way you're going to know that it really helped is by the end product the, you know incorporate almost all the whole process is that your assessment too that uh, there currently is an inability to do sort of units of that well, I, I guess I take a little issue with that. For example, let's look at the winding machine. Winding machine is just one of the really critical elements uh, uh, of, of cell manufacturing. And th there it's making a jelly roll and uh, getting the tension just right and getting, getting the, uh, the mechanical dimensions all right at, at the end of it. And it's a matter of throughput. How many PPM are you getting through there? And um, it, with those quality standards that it's wound correctly, the right tension, the right, uh, and the alignment is correct. So you can measure that. It's uh, um, so that they, so they they actually they can make improvements. It's actually a lot easier to do that than with batteries. I mean, they, this is one of the things that just kills me with with batteries. And we all often get asked in the industry, why does innovation take so long with batteries? Well, it's because to to evaluate the batteries takes six months, and then you 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 build something, you wait six months, and it's like okay, well, that didn't work. So then you go back and you start over again. Um, but with a, a winding machine, you can actually see it right there. You're like, okay, did it did it come through? Is it lined up? Is it is the tension right? Uh, uh, how fast was it? And so you can actually you can do a lot more. I think um, it you you can you, know, you you can make improvements faster. The learning cycle, I think, is quite a bit faster than it is with batteries. Yeah, it seems like you can actually characterize or have metrics that you can measure for that yeah. particular process that you can then. Uh, Make sure that your battery metrics are, are, are make sure that your metrics are being met, and you can just continue to yeah. uh, progress very fast. 
but if you have to do the whole battery, it's a real struggle. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, okay. and, and let me let me refine that. So <laughs> it, it's not that there aren't unit processes, as Kurt, as Kurt pointed out, and it's not that in the semiconductor industry, you know, integration doesn't matter at all. Of course they do. I, I what I I think I should be more careful and say that uh, the the balance of un, you know it's easier to do unit process assessment in the semiconductor industry than it is in the the battery in the battery industry. And um, obviously, you know, when you have a drop-in solution where it doesn't change anything, that's a much that's a preferred kind of uh, kind of space. Um, so yeah, I, I I think that the, it's more challenging to do unit tool development in battery space than it is in the semiconductor space. Again, well, fantastic. I mean, it's not electronics. Yes, no, no. This is this is very exciting, and it's it's great to see uh, that you know there's just so much factories in the works right now that are being planned or announced uh it's a uh, it's a uh, it'll be an amazing and exciting journey for the next 10 years i think we'll all be uh we'll either just be uh witnessing an enormous rapid transformation of our uh, transportation industry where you're going to see evs everywhere you know or we're going to be finding that it's going to be really hard to scale and ramp up. and uh, so i think we're all in for a very exciting time um so what I'd like to do is just give you a last few minutes uh, and any thoughts that you would share in general, uh, and then we can uh, we can go ahead and wrap it up. Kurt, any last thoughts? Wait, well, one one uh, point. I, I just realized that I'm drinking this and it may look like beer. I'm, I'm, it is East Coast here, but I'm not drinking. It is just water. Just want to make, want to make sure everyone's aware of that. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll let Abraham go first on this. Uh, uh, let me let me think about uh, any closing thoughts here. Yeah, so I, there was one thing I wanted to wanted to say say is, is that you know riffing off of what Kurt said about you know timelines limiting um, the introduction of innovation. Like when you have to ramp up, you, you know you kind of start to drop all those you know grand ambitions and and and, and ideas that you had because you got to get the thing the factory up and running and, and producing. And especially in Toyota's case, because our production of EVs and plug-in uh, HEVs and, and HEVs uh, or eight, you know hybrid vehicles is, depends on the output of, of the factory in North Carolina. However, I think one of the things about an informatics approach or data-driven approach is that in the beginning, you can use predictive algorithms and, and, and methodologies to kind of say, hey, Based on this, I think this is going to be the output. So you can operate in a sort of shadow mode, and, and you can show people with the data and, and with the with the predictions that this actually works. And so you don't it's there, it's not an either or. Like you, you can operate in uh, in you can you have an informatics platform that operates in parallel, kind of in, in like I said in that shadow mode until people are convinced that that works. Now, ideally. I would like to have it an integral part of production, but you know the reality is that, you know, as Kurt and I have pointed out, that they're going to bring experienced people into that, and you don't want to be getting in there, you know, arguing with them and saying no, no, because you know you have to get that kind of ramp done. So I think the good news is that data-driven approaches are not incompatible with even a traditional way of starting up, and I think that you can use them right away. Well, it's the choice of of the you know of the production of who's running the plant. To use them, and certainly, I think everybody acknowledges this issue of labor shortages, and and is most people, I think, are interested in, in using this approach. So, yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Abraham. Kurt. Yeah, I guess um, uh, just an observation. You know, I, I spend a lot of time uh, traveling, at least half my time traveling, meeting with customers, uh, uh, Europe, Asia, and just got back from a trip to Europe last week, and I'm going there again uh, next week. Um, the uh, and I, I meet with executives there, and it's really encouraging to see what's what's really changed o over the last, uh, I mean, the last twenty years, but really over the last two years or so is just this real change with the execs buying into EVs. There's no longer a sales pitch that's needed. Like you guys really got to be focusing on EVs. That's done. That work is is, is done. The 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 execs now are. It's EVs. This is the direction we're going, and they're really clear on that. And now it's just a matter of implementing it. And so it's it's kind of trickling down with their workforce. They're like their their workforce now is starting to begin to understand. Oh, 
Oh yeah, that okay. We're not gonna do another generation of the ICE motor. We're this is we're kind of winding that down and and we're gonna instead we're going to shift a lot of these people that were doing ICEs. They're, now they're going to be over in, in EVs, and uh, um, it's really encouraging to to see all that uh, that 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 activity in the market. And uh, um, we we hope to make it better because uh, make it easier for them to make that shift. Because they they um, uh, I mean batteries are they define so much about the vehicle, whether it's the performance, the safety, the feel for it, the, the inside, how much space you have inside. I mean, it, it just defines so much of the vehicle. And uh, um, so we're, we're we're hoping to make that easier and make it a better experience uh, for everybody by having a uh, longer driving range, faster charge. I mean, you can, if you can charge your vehicle in eight minutes, so eight minutes is how long it takes an ICE to charge. If you can charge it a similar amount of time, then, I mean, there's nothing else. There's no other metric that uh, uh, that ICE beats the the EV on. Well, maybe top speed, uh, maybe another one, but uh, we don't really care about that. The mass market doesn't care about that. So, anyway, I'm really excited uh, about going forward. And I think that at CELA, what we're trying to do is make it make the battery even better, so make it easier for uh, consumers to adopt uh, EVs. Okay, well, fantastic. Thank you both for participating in our uh, ramping production in the U.S. Stories from the front lines. It's great to see. Uh, your thoughts and share your plans uh, with everybody. And uh, just, uh, Abraham, I, you know, I, I think this whole idea of informatics is is one of the key ways that potentially we could, you know, we could scale so quickly, is that this becomes something which is widespread, efficiency goes up. It's something which in fact can be deployed in, and um, standardized across and shared across the various battery manufacturers. So it's great to see that you're piloting and pioneering this at Toyota. So with that, uh, I want to thank you. And uh, I'd like to go to the final slide announcing. Yeah, so just uh, join us for our StorageX Tech Talks, which are the first Tuesday of every month. These are highlights of energy storage research here at Stanford. And also, uh, we have a um, <clears throat> online course. If you're interested in these various areas, just simply log on to that and uh, join us. So with that, thank you again. Thank you, Abraham. Thank you, Kurt. And uh, we will catch you guys later. Great. Uh, best of luck on your ramps. This is an amazing, exciting story to watch. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.